All right, everyone, welcome to the second MicroMass lecture. We're going to go ahead and get started here. So uh, before we start talking about uh, motors and encoders, we have a few announcements to make. So uh, I'll take the first point. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, your kits have not arrived yet. This is not because uh, this is not because this is not the post office fault. They haven't been shipped yet uh, for some unforeseen, uncontrollable logistical issues. Um, I, I don't I don't think any of you, the rest of you, live near too close. But there was a big old fire in Southern California, Silverado fire, and uh, I got evacuated for like the past three days. But I'm I came back home this afternoon. But um, yeah, so could not ship out kits during that time. So instead, we're going to have them shipped out tomorrow. And uh, that being said, the assignment due dates will be pushed back as needed. So first one, it's going to be pushed back again. Sorry to keep changing it, but it's going to be pushed back to the ninth just to make sure you get your kit on time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so Bradley. Yeah. Keep going. Um, oh, just one, one more thing based off of that. We know it's going to be a little bit more rushed once you have your kids to get everything done. So next Saturday, we're going to host a work session um, in place of the, well, yeah, we're going to, we're in place of another event we had planned, um, the rock costume contest, and that's going to be pushed back another week. So we'll, we'll have some extra time available where you can come in and get help just to make sure you don't spend extra time um, struggling with that. Um, an update about the Eagle licenses. So we know that student licenses aren't a thing for Eagle anymore. And I was thinking about reaching out to Altium, which is another PCB design software, seeing if they would be interested in giving us a few licenses for us to use. Um, is that something you guys would be interested in? Type, yeah, or actually a yes in the chat or do a thumbs up if it's if it's a yes. Um, and if so, then I can, uh... Yep. All right, just uh, just so you know, it is a very thick program, like thick with two C's. It only runs on Windows, so if Six you're a Mac user, install, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if you're a Mac user, you need to have like either Parallels or Boot Camp installed or find a PC to run it on. Um, and it is a bit of a steep learning curve. So um, just a warning. That being said, is are you, is the is the uh, interest still there? I think I think the interest uh, is pretty overwhelming in the chat. So. Uh... I guess I'm okay. going to finally have to convert to the whole Altium thing. So uh, right. uh, hopefully you, you got me Bradley. Yeah. So uh, hopefully in winter, we'll have some um, something around Altium. We'll still do a lot of our assignments in Eagle because that'll take a while to get set up. But I can reach out to Altium, probably get a few student licenses. I don't know how many we can get. But um, yeah, I'm excited. We are rats for design in Altium so you guys can see all the source stuff for that instead of just seeing screenshots and online viewers and things like that. Yeah. Last yeah. but not least, there's a there's a hardware hackathon coming up. Idea hacks. Um, it was a lot of fun this year. It's gonna be different this year since it's on it's online. They're mailing out kits, little kits of parts. So still still get to play with some hardware, kind of like Micro Mouse. Uh, but yeah, um, it's, it's really fun. You'll have the chance to compete against Tyler and I, <laughs> if that's some motivation. <laughs> yeah. We should, how how many uh, leaderboard points is it if they uh, place above? <laughs> no, nah, that's oh, not that they, that, I don't. We'll we'll deal with that. But uh, a lot, right, a lot of right. points. All right. Yeah, we'll see. Anyways, um, there's more information on the IEEE Facebook, and uh, we've been plugging it in the Discord and everywhere. So uh, go check it out if that's something you're interested in. Uh, yeah. All that said, uh, let's get started. Uh, so in today's lecture, we'll be talking about motors, a bunch of different types, and then a little bit how to control them. And then we'll be talking about encoders, which are they're used to help the rat know where it is. So you'll they read the learn motors how those pretty work. much. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's start. So uh, motors, uh, your rat isn't gonna get to the center of the maze by itself, so it needs a way to move. So uh, See, there's a lot of different types. So uh, let's talk about why we use the types we do. So um, let's start. There's brushless and stepper motors. They both operate in the same way. Um, let's see there. If you look at this uh, breakdown here, uh, it seems like they're superior to brush motors in most ways. And they are, they're a little more efficient and uh, a little smoother. 
Um, however, they're a little more expensive and uh, they're harder to control. So how these, how brushless motors work, you don't have to remember this, but there's magnets that attach to the spinning part of the motor. And then there's essentially a bunch of electromagnets around it. And then if you energize the magnets in the right order, then it'll start spinning. So that takes a lot of complicated circuitry to control. So it's a little more expensive. Uh, but then, uh, then we have brush motors. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna show you some awesome gifts while I talk about brush motors. So um, they, uh, <laughs> okay, so brush motors, they operate differently. The magnets are stationary on the outside. And uh, I'm not gonna dive into why, but you can convince yourself uh, if, you, uh, <laughs> if you are so inclined to. Uh, basically, all you need to do in order to get a brush motor to spin is apply a voltage to uh, two wires and then uh, the consequence of its geometry is it'll start spinning. And then to control the speed, there's it's not a very fancy, it's not rocket science. You just higher voltage equals higher speed. So there you go. What about, what about direction? Direction, ooh, thanks Bradley. I almost forgot about direction. So change direction, you just, so there's two wires coming out of a brush motor. So if you apply positive voltage on one side, it'll spin one way. And if you flip your wires around, it'll spin the other way. So again, oh, what? That, that sounds so easy. Is it really that easy? Bradley, stop. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a slide or two. Um, so um, yeah, so that's how a brush motor works. And uh, again, it's not too important to know exactly why that's the case, but um, I will be happy to talk to you all about motor construction if, afterwards if you are uh, curious. Um, anyway, so uh, brush, so so we use brush motors because they're cheaper, smaller, um, and they're easier to control, and that's all we really need for micro mouse. Uh, so, um, however, when you apply when you apply a voltage to a uh, brush motor, they just start spinning up as fast as they can for that particular voltage. So um, it's, and all, their natural spinning speed is way too fast. And there's also really low torque. It's like a uh, hundreds or thousands of RPM or something. So um, we need, so you need to uh, slow it down. So uh, most of these, uh, most DC gear motors uh, or their brush motors with a gearbox on them. So uh, you guys know how gears work, right? Um, so gears, uh, yeah, so if you have a lower gear ratio, then um, you're going to uh, reduce the speed less. And then you're going to, you're going to increase your torque just a little bit, but it'll still be up the, it'll be closer to the original high speed. So the higher your gear ratio gets, then uh, the more of that speed you trade off for torque. So uh, there's a trade-off between the two. And uh, for the motors on our rats, uh, a good balance we found is a 30 to one gear ratio. So um, every time, uh, so if you see in this picture, there's that small little, do I have a laser? No, I don't. Oh, wait, I do have a laser pointer. Wait, dude, laser pointer. Oh my gosh. OK, so, um, okay, so there's uh, this little shaft right there. So uh, that's, the, that's connected to the main output shaft of this motor. So every time that turns 30 times, the big output shaft that your wheels will be attached to will rotate one time. So uh, 30 to 1 gear ratio. Uh, Does anyone have any questions about anything we just gone over, either brushless versus brushed motors? Your ratio stuff like that type yes in the chat if you're ready to continue all right that's true what is stall great mm -hmm. um I, i'm about to get to that so um the so our motors operate at a six volts so it's just how they're constructed so stall current is a uh, Okay, so if you just have the motor on and there's no resistance, it's just free spinning in air, then it's not going to draw that much current. It's just, it has no, uh, what's called load attached. Uh, like if you lift your car off the ground, 
and you press on the gas and it just doesn't have to move the car, it's going to have a very easy time accelerating. But um, as you apply more and more um, resistance to rotation, uh, it's going to try to draw more current to fight against that. So stall current is the maximum current that it's going to draw uh, if you, so that's if you like completely stop the motor. So if you just attach a big clamp to the output shaft and it's trying to spin, uh, but you're preventing it from doing so, uh, it's going to draw in this case 0.67 amps. Uh, so that's uh, helpful to know so that you can uh, kind of, so when you're designing a circuit to control a motor, uh, that you know what your worst case current draw is. Uh, output power is related to that. Um, let's see, stall torque, same thing. Uh, if you're clamping it down, even if it's not moving, it's going to be resist trying to turn with the torque of, uh, in this case, 0.33 kilograms per centimeter. Uh, that's not too important. Uh, what's important to know is it's a brush DC motor and it's uh, it's good enough for what we're doing in MicroMouse. All right. So uh, you'll, you'll notice it's six volts. Our batteries together are 7.4 volts. Uh, so it's a little over spec, but it's close enough that it's not such a big deal and the motors are okay. All right, uh, let's talk about how to control these things, yeah? Okay, so motor control. So uh, here's, here's the first way you might think of to do it. Uh, so uh, we need to turn the motor on and off, right? So the microcontroller, uh, like you'll be doing in the first assignment, you can turn LED on, on and off. So can you control motor in the same way directly? Uh, first issue with that, the microcontroller is at 3.3 volts. Um, even if it could supply enough current to the motor, 3.3 volts is really low. It's not gonna be spinning very fast. Uh, the second problem is uh, the microcontroller pins, they can't really provide much current. Like for an LED, it's fine. LED is low power, but uh, the motor, uh, like we said, 0.67 amps or 670 milliamps. So uh, no, nope, doesn't work. So uh, Bradley is going to tell us how we uh, how we actually do it. Bradley, you're muted, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, the simple solution is just to use a transistor. Um, transistors are just simple digital switches we can use. We can control. Other stuff we can say turn on, turn off. Um, so yeah, we can use that to turn on our motor. Um, so we have an NPN transistor here. If you want to go into specifically why an NPN transistor, you can uh, ask us later. <laughs> but uh, also, if you want to know why that resistor there is there, it's basically just to limit the current going into the transistor. But yeah, this is the general setup. There is uh, actually first uh, just know that so like when you turn on the transistor, that'll allow current to flow. Um, and your motor turns on, and that's exactly what we want. However, motors, specific, or more, more generally inductors, behave kind of weirdly when you turn them off. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, basically what happens when you turn them off is they store up a lot of current in there, and they don't like seeing that current stop. So what a motor will do is it'll just basically do what it can to keep the current flowing, and that's really dangerous for us because it'll push a bunch of current through our circuit and that can break our transistor. Um, so what we got to do is we got to add a little diode in there. Um, it's called a flyback diode. And basically that allows our motor to discharge at, an, at, a nice, at a nice rate where it won't damage our transistor and it'll, it'll let everything go down safely. Um, so yeah, it's a little animation that shows you what, what it does when you turn it off, that, that, that voltage can flow back up to the top yeah. Um, and discharge safely. Yeah, real quick, just to make it clear, I'm gonna use my laser pointer again. Oh, shoot. Uh, wait, oh, I have a pen too. Dang, this is incredible. Okay, so uh, you turn the transistor on, power goes. How do I use this? Pen? Okay, never mind, pen doesn't work. Um, okay, so current's gonna flow. You activate this, current can flow through the motor, but then if you turn off the transistor, then there's no current, current can't flow through here. But um, because uh, if you know, for, remember, can recall from a circuits class, if you've taken one at UCLA, current uh, through an inductor or inductive load, like a motor, uh, it can't change instantaneously. So it's going to try to force its way through the transistor, at, even though it's closed now. And that's going to damage it if you don't give the current an alternate way to dissipate. 
So again, uh, instead, current goes back to this. Any yeah. sense? Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, either like why we choose to turn on motors this way, um, why other ways don't work. So, um, does that does that make sense? So either type yes. I have a, oh, I have a yes. question. Go ahead. Awesome. So since the current goes back to the battery, does that recharge the battery? Um, not but actually. Well, you can. There's some optimizations. You know how um, if you're in an electric car, you have regenerative braking. So I'm I'm pretty sure I haven't looked into this too much, so I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Yeah. So you're you're forcing the current to take an all a path that's backwards essentially. Mo I think for the most part in this scenario, uh, it most of the power just gets dissipated by the diode, and uh, the reason it's yeah the reason it's a diode instead of say just a wire is because um, if it were just a wire, then current would it just bypass the motor and go. Uh, it would never power the motor. It's just sh shorts past it. Uh, so if current's flowing in the correct direction, uh, it will be blocked off by the diode. But if it's trying to go the reverse direction, reverse EMF, this, uh, back EMF, whatever you want to call it. I think I think we should move on, Tyler. There we go. Okay. We're getting too deep into this. Um, OK, so this is great. Um, However, this is not actually what we do, because um, they only—if you'll notice, this only allows us to turn our motors one direction. So, how do we get our motors to turn backwards? If we want to do that, we're going to need a bit of a more complicated circuit. This is um, an H bridge. Um, basically, it's four transistors: two on the top of the motor, two on the bottom of the motor, or two on each side of the motor. Um, instead of trying to explain how this exactly works because it's pretty confusing at first. We're just going to show you with some arrows and hopefully that makes sense. So to start off, let's say we turn on transistors A and transistors and D and let's see what happens. So you can see that current flows from the left side of the motor to the right side of the motor just based on the path that we've given the current to flow. Um, now let's try turning on transistors B and C. You'll see the path that the current can flow goes from right to left. Um, if you want to look at this more, um, it's I feel like it's something you kind of just have to look at for a little bit and understand what's going on. But this is a clever way that someone came up with some time to, uh, to figure out how we can send current either one way through a motor or the other way through a motor. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so. Uh, and then. Quick oh. warning about H bridges. Yeah. Um, if you happen to turn on both transistors A and C or B and D at the same time, then uh, we've essentially created a short circuit uh, and uh, this happens. And your batteries won't like you very much after you do that. So uh, don't do it. Uh, yeah. There you go. Does All this right. make sense? Do you guys have questions? Those diodes in, in there, by the way, are just flyback diodes like what we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Desmond. Um, so uh, when you are controlling this, if you want to turn, make it go, have current flow from left to right, then yeah, you would want to turn A and D on at the same time. And really easy way to do that is just connect both of them to the MCU, uh, same pin uh, at the same time, right? Yes. All right. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, I guess uh, drop, a, drop a yes in the chat. Right, it's like move on. Um, there we go. Let's see. Awesome. Yeah, let's go. Okay, so now we know how to turn on our motor. We know how to turn it on backwards. Now, how do we make it go fast or slow? JK. Oh, <laughs> yeah, JK. This is the motor. Um, this is the motor driver we have on our. Shoot, I forgot about the slide. Um, if you want to look at the data sheet. Um, there it is. You can see the supply voltage is up to 36 volts. Um, yeah, so voltage. These are the maximum ratings. So it's just like we can't go above this. Our input voltage refers to this to the logic level. So that's 3.3 volts from the MCU. Output current is 1.2 amps. You saw earlier that it's where our motors only draw up to 0.67 amps. So we're good with that. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what we care about here. Yeah, so this is just an H bridge in a physical box. 
All right, so now we'll talk about how to control speed. So we control direction, turn it on and off. Uh, let's, uh, let's change the speed. All right, so um, for DC motors, like I said the earlier, uh, you can control the speed, it rotates that by adjusting the voltage that you are giving to it. So um, it's kind of hard to, so if I want to go at half speed instead of six volts, maybe I give it three. Uh, however, our MCU is, is a, it's a, it's a digital thing, it can only be on or off. So how do you achieve three uh, half voltage? Uh, we use a technique called pulse width modulation. So um, essentially what we're doing is switching on and off really fast. So a uh, cool figure to the right hand side. So if it's on half the, half the time and off half the time, that's what's called 50% duty cycle. And uh, as you turn it on for a longer amount of time, all the way up to 100, we're just on constantly. So um, there's a, so a set, what we're essentially doing is the average value here of their uh, voltage is going to be um, whatever percent duty cycle you are of the supply voltage. So for example, uh, supply voltage is six, uh, but we have a 50% duty cycle, then it's gonna be on half the time, off the half the time, the average value is three volts, perfect. Um, there is a there is one thing to note about this, and uh, it's that uh, for, uh, yeah, so the, it works best with inductive loads like a motor. If it's an LED, that LEDs can turn off and on kind of instantaneously. So it'll, it'll just be on and off really fast. But for motor, like I said, the current um, doesn't change instantaneously. So um, what you have is this ramping effect in the current flowing through your motor when you uh, uh, are, have the frequency going really high. So if your pulse width modulated signal is really, really fast, then uh, you get, then your ripple in the current going through the motor is going to settle at a relatively stable value at, a, like I said, the duty cycle times your supply voltage. All right. Um, yeah. so Does that make sense you, to you guys? Um, just the general idea of like averaging out a digital signal as an analog signal? All right. All right. I think yeah, we should probably get moving on. This yeah. is running a little longer than I intended. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're ready to move on to encoders. Encoders are the way we read our motors because motors have all types of different differences in like the way they're manufactured, the way like it, when you're actually running them, if they hit something, they'll run slower. So we need a way to measure what our motors are actually doing. Like how far are we going? Is it actually working? Is it actually turning? Is it disconnected? Um, we use encoders to do that. And once you get encoders working, you can basically tell your mouse, like, I want you to go 2.367 inches and it'll do it. And it's so satisfying. You used inches, gross. Why not say Oh, inches? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, <laughs> the world is just like that. Even like PCB design, you have like mils and centimeters. Like you Got use it. both metric and imperial. It's, it's okay. I'm getting right. sidetracked. Anyway, so. Um, just some background on like the types of encoders that are out there. Um, you have both magnetic and optical encoders. Those are the two main types. I mean, there's also like a bunch of other ones, but we're not going to get into that. Um, magnetic ones use a magnet. Optical ones shine a light through a hole, and it measures how many times that blinks. If you look on the, the bottom, that's an example of an optical. We won't we won't get into that right now. Um, you also have on-axis and off-axis encoders. That's just pretty much what it sounds like, whether it measures the poles on axis on the axis of rotation or off the axis of rotation. On the left is an off axis one, on the right is an on axis one. Um, basically what you need to know is our, the encoder we use is an off axis one that has two sensors. Um, so we use Hall effect sensors. And what those do is those measure a magnetic field and change their output voltage based on whether the field is positive or negative or, actually, or non-existent. Um, so yeah, in our case, it outputs one while it senses a positive pole and it outputs negative or it outputs zero when it senses a negative pole. Um, and the magnets we have are, have three, three of each positive and negative. You can see a little diagram of them on the slide. 
Um, so our sensors sense those poles as they're changing and then outputs that to our MCU. Um, this is, okay, just a forewarning, it's kind of complicated to understand what's going on here. It took me like, honestly, a few weeks after I first learned this, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's what's happening. But um, just as a visual demonstration, um, to start off, Tyler, if you want to click once, um, we have those, that red line represents our two sensors. So our sensors are spent spaced 90 degrees apart. You can see that the one on the top senses a positive pole. That is what we're starting off with. Now, let's see what happens when we rotate the magnet 30 degrees. Hold on to your hats, everyone. It's, it's going to be wild. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, my gosh. So there you go. Now you see the one on the right now senses a negative pole. It's perfectly aligned to that sensor. And that's where we're, we're going to sense a zero at sensor number two. Now let's rotate another 30 degrees. Get ready. <laughs> oh, incredible. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Now you can see that the sensor on the top has changed to a negative. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Now it outputs a zero. We can read that one. Um, and then we go a third time going 30 degrees. You can see that the one on the right, sensor two, now senses positive. Um, so you can see that each time the sensor we're looking at changes um, and it changes poles too. So we, send, so we say like, wait for sensor two to change and then sensor one to change, and then sensor two to change, and then sensor two one to change, and we can alternate back and forth, and that's how we read our encoders. Um, actually, at a quick note on the precision of those, if you noticed, um, we have four ticks equals 90 degrees, which means 12 ticks equals one revolution. And also remember that our gearbox is 30 to one. Actually, it's like 29.86, but it's 30 to one. Um, multiply that together, that tells us that we get 360 ticks per revolution of our output, which means that we can measure our motor output to a degree or to one degree of precision, which I think is pretty cool because one degree is pretty small. Yep. Um, seen more graphically, um, that's what it looks like on the output. You can see um, output A is one, one, of the, uh, one of the Hall effect sensors, output B is the other one. Um, you can see that it alternates which one changes. And also by looking at which one changes first, we can actually tell the direction of our motors. Um, I think the it's the animations are a little bit clearer, but does that make sense to you guys? Do you get like generally what's going on with that? I know it can be kind of confusing. Okay. Um, the uh, the exact mechanism of how counting up and down with this system works is uh, if you like the slides are going to be posted after, so you can stare at this and convince yourself, but um, it's not super critical to know exactly how it works, but here's the background information yeah. anyways. Uh, you guys don't actually need to know how to do any of this. There's a really nice feature on the microcontroller that basically says like, I have an encoder hooked up into these pins can, and I wanna read them and it takes care of everything for you. So honestly, like you don't really need to know this. Don't say that, I think it's, I think it's well, I th it's good to know. It's good to know what's happening. And I think it's really interesting to know what's going on. But like, for the purposes of finishing this assignment, you don't you don't have to implement it yourself. That's all. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, summarize, I'll do my part, Bradley. So brush, we use brush motors on the rat uses uses a gearbox to uh, balance out how fast it turns with how much torque we need to get the rat moving. Then, uh, yeah, Bradley. Yeah, we're going to use an H bridge to control direction. Use PWM um, to control the speed. And we use encoders to see what's actually going on. All right, cool. So, um, just before we move on, does anyone want to want us to go over any of these again? Any questions on anything that's come up? Anything you're confused about? All right. Awesome. Sounds good. So uh, now, uh, now, what are what oh, do wait, you guys wait. have to do, huh? The PWM on the MCU. Oh, that is actually not fixed, and you'll see that in your assignment. You can the base frequency of the um, of the MCU, like it can oscillate at sixteen megahertz. I'm pretty sure, but you can change the PWM frequency based on yeah how much how many 
clock cycles you count up to. Yeah, uh, there in the assignment, there's a very uh, extensive uh, auxiliary note that's like, no, if you are for the curious, uh, here's exactly how the frequency uh, is determined by a setting different parameters in cube IDE, which hopefully you guys have a start to play with. Um, so anyways, uh, what are you guys going to have to do with everything that you just learned? Uh, having a nice assignment for you guys. Uh, <laughs> has I'll have it, this. Uh, By the end, you'll have um, some your H bridge installed on your rat, your motors there. And then when you turn it on, oh, sorry, <laughs> disregard that. That's um, you can have your motors turning. I have mine turning um, 1000 encoder ticks and then actually or 500 encoder ticks and then it switches directions for the record that, that sounds terrifying it's okay <laughs> okay um cool so uh the assignment you can read uh install motors uh okay is this assignment two or part of assignment one it is assignment two uh assignment one's due date got pushed back to uh, the same due date as this uh, which should be okay since if you've done everything else in assignment one all you need to do is like plug it in and click upload and in mm -hmm. theory that should work uh but again apologies yeah. guys uh I, uh circumstances out of our control uh prevented us from shipping the kits out when we said we would okay um, um and also we will have that extra work session next next saturday just to help you guys we we are planning on shipping them out tomorrow um, and then I'm, I think it's three to five business days from there. So that should be like middle to end of next week. Yes. Hopefully faster, hopefully. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's the assignment. Uh, now uh, the fun part. Uh, dang. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> having a costume contest for rats, it's a little silly, but um, online school is a uh, hard and a uh, it's hard to get to know you all. So Bradley and I thought this would just be a silly, fun way to kind of interact or do something creative. And uh, there, there's some prizes in it too. Uh, we'll keep those a secret for now. Uh, I don't know, yeah. get creative. I was thinking I'd make like a shell, to, like a Lightning McQueen shell to put on my rat or something. I don't know, like literally yeah. do whatever you want. Um, I, did, submit. I did this in 15 minutes. So I want to see what you guys can come up with. And also like, I want to see what you guys, I just want to see what you guys can come up with because there's there's 40 something of you guys and I think between that we can we can get some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, submit uh, we will form. We'll send details out later. Uh, but it was going to be next Saturday. Uh, but it is Actually, no it wasn't going to be this. Originally we were planning on having it this Saturday as a Halloween thing and then right. that didn't happen. Yeah, so it, it everything <laughs> keeps getting pushed up back because you guys don't have your kids yet. All right, anyways, uh, that being said, that's all for today. Lecture is a little longer than the first one. So uh, thanks for sticking around and I uh, hope you guys thought it's interesting. Bradley, if you want to stick around for like, I don't know, yeah. five minutes for questions or whatever, but I'll go yeah. ahead and end the recording. How do I do this? Stop recording, um, easy.